that's a red line for us. There would be enormous consequences if we start seeing movement on the chemical weapons front uh, or the use of chemical weapons. first protests start in March of 2011. They start because teenagers have been tortured for graffiti. At that point, people are marching across the Middle East and North Africa. The Syrians join. They march for nine months, more or less, without firing back. That society had already reached breaking point with respect to you know, electricity, to water, to all those things that sustain life. They're getting killed in the streets. The regime is getting more and more violent. Assad lost legitimacy when he started uh, firing uh, on his own people and killed. We are all hearing the drums of war around us. Hezbollah poured in. Will we help Syria? We will. Take measures against the perpetrators of this crime. Egypt is against Western military intervention. He released an awful lot of the jihadists he had in jail. He wanted this to be between him and violent extremists, and he did everything he could to make that happen. 80 to 90 percent of the rebels on the ground of the terrorists are Al-Qaeda. It's very cynical stuff. The foreign fighter flows into Syria completely dwarf any level of foreign fighter movement that we saw in Iraq. We are not affiliated with anyone inside or outside of Syria. If Al-Qaeda works to establish law and justice among the people and spreads religion in the country, then we are with Al-Qaeda. They are not extremists and jihadists, and the Syrian people would reject extremists and jihadists. We were 100 percent sure that the Iranians are involved in killing civilians in Syria. I think some colleagues uh, uh, jumped to their conclusions. China is deeply concerned about certain countries preparing for unilateral military action. The United States really has four interests, uh, in at least four interests, in, in, in what's going on in Syria. To give imposed consequences in, uh, for the chemical use that Syria has already done and make sure there is no repetition of it. Bringing uh, to the end a war that has been a humanitarian disaster for the Syrian people, a war that is increasing sectarian and is spreading beyond its borders and risks destabilizing uh, Lebanon, Iraq, Jordan, and Turkey, and a war that is facilitating Al-Qaeda. And then finally, of course, this is an effort by Iran to, through Hezbollah to extend its hegemony. Hezbollah is essentially controlled by the Syrians and the Iranians. And uh, we've seen Hezbollah aggression cross-border against Israel. Uh, we're seeing the dissolution of the Lebanese state for what, the third time uh, in my lifetime uh, as a result of, of this uh, of basically uh, uh, Hezbollah fighting uh, with, the rest of, uh, with the rest of the country. When an event like Syria uh, erupts, uh, those who believe in the American mission and American uniqueness see Syria as an opportunity to, to demonstrate how special we are. And then, of course, Obama made his ill-fated red line uh, comments. We start seeing a whole bunch of chemical weapons moving around or being utilized. Uh, that would change my calculus. That would change my equation. Our sense of basic humanity is offended the use of these weapons uh, have to be responded to. And if we do nothing, more people will die. It'll be more sectarian. We will open the door more for Al-Qaeda. And it's pretty clear that Assad is already, during the week of the negotiations, had doubled down. So those are the things that happen if we don't do something. I do believe a very important red line has been crossed. A red line that I believe justified the immediate use of force by the United States. I am always struck by the, those making the humanitarian argument. There are people suffering, we need to help them, and therefore we should bomb Damascus. It's not clear to me how bombing Damascus is going to alleviate the suffering. I have decided that the United States should take military action against Syrian regime targets. Hands up, Syria! 
There is a new CBS News New York Times poll this morning that finds the vast majority of Americans, 61% oppose a U.S. military strike on Syria. We got to take care of our own. What chemical weapons? There's been no proof. Syria is the only Arab nation resisting Western colonialism and Israel. Saudi Arabia says it will support the U.S. military intervention in Syria. No matter what actions you take, there are going to be negative second order effects. No one denies that America has the ability to take action and that America can make that decision on its own. The rest of the world can applaud, disparage, threaten or whine, but no one can force the United States to act and no one can stop it. If one head of state can tell another head of state what he can do in his own country, what does that make the country that gives the orders? An empire? Certainly not an empire. <laughs> not at this point. An invasion and occupation is the failure of American policy. If we could do it by having collaborators in other, other places, if we can do it by getting people to sign on to treaties, by getting people to set up free trade zones, then this is a success for the United States. But that's still different from real empire, which means one country uh, subjugating and exploiting another, which was much more the way was the world was organized before the middle of the 20th century. We know our vital national security interests include uh, supporting our allies, but we also know that vital national security interests include countering the pro proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Everyone expected Washington to strike and strike hard. But instead, there was inaction, uh, confusion, uh, reflection, but on the other hand, consideration, <laughs> investigations. Assad was not intimidated. He struck back his weapon of choice, a TV talk show. Charlie Rose. Obama can draw a line for himself and for his country, not for other countries. We have our red lines, like our sovereignty and our independence. Why did the United States fail in most of its wars? Because it always based its war on the wrong information. American people don't want another Iraq. Uh, the international community is not providing any significant support. And so for domestic political reasons, that leads the administration, specifically Kerry, to try to minimize the significance of any military action. Of course, as soon as they do that, in effect, they're saying that any military action will, by definition, be ineffective. Any military strike would have been such a disaster that virtually any known alternative would be better. Remind us again why we have to do this? The more reluctant you are and the more deliberative you are, the danger is that you can start looking weak. Bullies and tyrants don't respect weakness. Oh, right, we have to bomb Syria because we're in seventh grade. <laughs> I think that we have to go back to the basics, that it was illegal, it would have been immoral because it would have created more casualties, as all the military leaders said. It would not have stopped the war. It would not have prevented any use of chemical weapons by anyone. And it would have been dangerous because as much as the war in Syria is now already, it's spread into at least five separate wars that are being waged to the last Syrian. That would have been spreading even further if the U.S. had gone in directly with a, a, a direct military intervention. In order for the United States not to intervene, the United States has to now progress to a new status. The new status is that we have to issue one of our doctrines, like the Monroe Doctrine, one of those things, and say that the armed forces of the United States shall not be employed in any area but for the immediate protection of American citizens who are facing immediate peril, or something like that. So how about because then, how otherwise there is so, a presumption of intervention. So how about war seemed more inevitable than ever? But then, like a deus ex machina, a god coming down on stage to fix things. Vladimir Putin appeared. On Monday, the president suggested he might support a plan that would require Syria to surrender its chemical weapons stockpile. You know, Vladimir Putin has pretty much so played President Obama, if I can use an old Southern term, like a broken banjo. They've been completely incomprehensible. Diplomacy has been going on uh, for nearly two years and finally came to fruition this week in what seemed a series of accidents, but in fact were not. The deal got Obama nation. off the hook. Thanks very much. Chemical weapons off the battlefield. Let Russia act like a world power. It was a win-win-win. 
But what about the tens of thousands of Syrians who would continue to die in a civil war? If Assad stays, so do the secret police and the torture. If he goes, what follows? Chaos? Who is responsible? Who is supposed to act? Is it up to the world's sole superpower? What are the consequences if the United States acts? What are the consequences if it doesn't? I believe America is exceptional, in part because we have shown a willingness through the sacrifice of blood and treasure to stand up not only for our own narrow self-interest, but for the interests of all. This time, I have a deeply held preference for peaceful solutions. Did this mean that there are contradictory impulses in the American soul to rule or at least control the world? Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Or to tend its own garden and let everyone find their own way. Is America a reluctant empire? Just when I thought I was out, they pulled me back in. Or was this just a swing of the pendulum from hubris to modesty? The word reluctance, I don't think, is an appropriate word. Mm. This is liberal imperialism. Oh. This, is, uh, this is, as Obama and before him Hillary Clinton, Secretary Clinton said it, soft power. They operate with soft power, with uh, covert operations, with uh, proxy uh, wars, with special operations, you know, economic sanctions, drone attacks. This is a different warfare. It's a different mode of uh, military operation. No. What we learned was military power could topple a regime. Military power was not enough to reconstruct a society. And, and the lesson we learned, unfortunately, too well, was watch out for sins of commission. Watch out for using military power when you don't have a plan. But what we're learning in Syria is there are also sins of omission, of omission. This is a learning curve. This is a learning curve. This is the way we intervened in Bosnia, the way we intervened in Kosovo, the way we intervened in Libya. In all those cases, I think we got a better outcome with more room for more parties than we would have gotten had we just let the war continue. What some of the long, bloody messes in Iraq and Afghanistan have done over the past dozen years is to turn American opinion in a more skeptical direction. You get the liberal interventionists, people who think that the United States can change things uh, uh, for humanitarian reasons or for whatever reasons. Neocons who have been very, very quick to reach for a gun. Anti-interventionists, uh, liberals, and libertarians who are just out-and-out -out isolationists. The first argument that America is not an empire is that it doesn't seize territory. In 1943, American troops landing in Italy and the Italians seeing these Americans, their uniforms that were made of real wool, which they hadn't seen, and these American soldiers giving out cans of corned beef and stuff like that. This was a certain, an America that was benevolent in its effects, benevolent in every manifestation, applauded, embraced, kissed on both cheeks, and wonderfully well liked. When America came home from these wars, we never asked for any land, we never asked for sovereignty over any other country. The only thing we asked for was enough land to bury our dead. The other argument is that Americans are just too nice to be real imperialists. Americans thought it was their manifest destiny to overspread and to possess the whole of the continent, which providence has given them. And in order to expand from sea to shining sea, the new Americans engaged in 300 years of warfare with the native Americans. Expansion didn't stop at the water's edge. It was a splendid little war. And profitable too. The United States has expanded much like any other empire denying that requires a form of delusion, followed by historical amnesia. With the advent of the modern period, the nature of empires changed. By the middle of the 20th century, the United States has stopped acquiring territory, but it kept 
acquiring power. There are 720 military bases, U.S. military bases uh, around, around the world. The United States is the only superpower in the world. It exerts influence everywhere in the world. And the United States has been the dominant force, the leader, uh, supplying uh, the, the principal sorts of security guarantees, uh, dominating uh, economic rules of the game, and so on. It has not only uh, interests, but also obligations to the international community. Still, many would deny that the United States is an empire because of its ideals, that it only fights to bring freedom and democracy to the world. Our nation enters this conflict reluctantly, only as a last resort. I think it's unfashionable to talk about that, but it's, it's the truth. Um, other countries that had the level of power that the United States have would almost certainly behave in a much in a way much less supportive of international stability and the benefits of other countries. The United States isn't like other countries. It's an empire of the mind and it's an empire of uh, militarism and it's an empire of mannerisms. Of, uh, uh, it wants people in the world to behave like uh, it behaves. We're going to change the entire country and its culture. We're going to go to yes, Afghanistan yes. and turn it into Sweden, we okay? Well, I don't think America throws around its pow power. I think it tries to use its policy power to achieve objectives that are good for the United States and, and good for the world. The American nation is not a racial nation. They're not a religious entity. They are, they are an ideological entity. And right at the beginning, President Washington, as he left office, said, we have to decide whether our project of bringing liberty but it is our duty to also extend it. And right then there was a debate between Americans who wanted to bring the American ideals to the whole planet. We're different, we're special, we're chosen. My everybody God. everybody My else God himself. everybody else wants to be like us. It's not only possible to be an empire with ideals, even an empire of ideals. Idealism may even be a necessary ingredient of the imperial recipe. When Hitler dismembers Czechoslovakia in 1938, he does so in the name of the protection, the humanitarian protection uh, of minorities. Uh, when Europe partitions Africa at the Congress of, of Berlin of 1884-85, it does so in the name of the humanitarian protection of Africans. Of course, empires almost always think they're doing the rest of the world a favor. When the weight of the Anglo-Saxon world domination began to shift from Britain to America, the poet of empire, Rudyard Kipling, wrote, Take up the white man's burden, send forth the best ye breed, go bind your sons to exile, to serve the captive's need. To wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild, your new court sullen peoples, half devil, half child. Still, many people believe that America exercises its power for the world's own good. America, America. America. If America is the world's policeman, it needs a vision. Of legality. The cornerstone of international law is that individual countries cannot make the decision to use force against another country except for two exceptions. Number one, self-defense, and number two, unless it's sanctioned by the Security Council of the United Nations. After the Cold War, there were neoconservatives who were very hot to uh, use American power in any way we could to make the, the world uh, as we thought it should be. And there were a lot of democratic liberals who, while they said we should do it in a different way, we should do it multilaterally with the cooperation of the United Nations or NATO, wanted to come out in the same place, wanted to use American power to bring order and stability to the world. Uh, but that was a gradual process. I mean, we didn't have responsibility to protect as a doctrine in 1939 or 36 or 38 uh, with the way the Germans were treating Jews, gypsies, Roma, and others. Um, but the idea is that responsibility to protect, R2P, is a right of intervention by other states when a state has breached norms 
and especially in terms of standards of conduct against its own people. I think we are evolving toward responsibility to protect. I mean, that was a norm that uh, all the nations in the United Nations signed off on at the 2005 Millennial Conference. What point does a state's use of armed force against its own people uh, result in a situation where they have uh, given up their right to have sovereign control of their own people. In other words, at what point do Assad's actions mean that he is no longer a legitimate sovereign power? The idea that a government cannot commit crimes against humanity or genocide or, or war crimes against its own people with, with impunity will seem as normal as the basic idea of human rights does today. I would come from exactly the opposite direction. Imperialism was the sudden acquisition by Europe of the new forms of power that came from industrial production, which led to the weapons revolutions of the 19th century and the capacity to apply massive force at a distance. I would suggest that what underlies uh, the uh, increased appetite to intervene abroad is the acquisition of new forms of power. It's not just the ghost of Iraq that's driving U.S. policy right now. It's the ghost of Vietnam, it's the ghost of Rwanda, it's the ghost of Bosnia, the ghost of Kosovo. Where we did take action or where we didn't take action. 